Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, so uh, I've lost one of my panelists, so it gives me great joy to say, John Waits, where are you? Can you come up to the stage and get mic'd, please? Um, so hopefully he, he does that. Okay. Oh, you're there. Good. Um, so let me just, uh, just to explain what's the motivation for this panel. So back in about 2008, uh, we had a commission on sustainable development education on this issue about training future leaders on sustainable development. And in that report, which was funded by the MacArthur Foundation, there was about 169 sort of core competencies that you'd want in a professional or an individual that's coming out of a university um, to actually be a professional in the sustainable development arena. Um, what happened was then is they recommended a two-year master's, which now has become the master's in development practice. The thing is, this was done nearly 10 years ago, and it's time to actually reflect again on the needs in terms of what do we need to do to train these leaders for sustainable development. And we have another foundation, Jeffrey Shaw Foundation, giving us another uh, bit of money to actually redo that commission on sustainable development education. And to do this, we're just going to be very open-minded, very open-minded in terms of technology is changing, the development arena has changed with the sustainable development uh, agenda out there and the sustainable development goals, and there's other sorts of challenges out there. Um, so what we're doing today is this, in this little panel bringing people from quite different sort of modalities in terms of training sustainable development leaders to give their reflections on what the leaderships or what education or what universities or what training should look like maybe in 2030 or how we move towards that or even in, uh, as far as uh, 2050. Um, so that's basically the aim of this panel. If you like the discussion in this panel, I will be washing the hash hashtag, so I'll be disruptive and bring your questions in as they come in on the hashtag, so please do that, hashtag ICSD2017. But on Wednesday, I said it wrong earlier, on Wednesday, uh, we, there is a side event on this issue that we're inviting everybody to come to, like all students, all people from the private sector, civil society, governments, universities, to come in and have a kind of a deep dive into the sort of the issues around like how should we be training the next generations of leaders for sustainable development and what should we be doing better, uh, what's good, what, what we're doing and what can we do better. Okay, to get the panel going, I'm first going to bring out Chandrika Balador, and she's president of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network Association. Thank you, Chandrika. Thank you. Um, so I might just ask Chandrika, like, that's a nice title, but is there other things that I should be, now what would you give me one, one of the big things? That's yes, it. so I think uh, for the purposes of this panel, what is much more relevant is that I lead the SDG Academy, which is um, an online initiative to teach young people uh, about the Sustainable Development Goals. Okay, the SDG, most people know that, but they should definitely look at the SDG Academy, right? Um, my next uh, panel speaker is Ramu Damodaran, who is the Chief of the United Nations Academic Impact. So should the audience know anything interesting about you other than this? Well, only before I wandered into diplomacy, I was doing voiceovers for radio in India, and many people think I should have stuck to that. Okay, <laughs> good. So communications will be part of this discussion, right. I have no doubt, right? Uh, next panel speaker is uh, Tom Gloria, who's the director of the sustainability program in the Division of Continual Education in Harvard University. Hi, Tom. Yeah, Paul. Thank you. So what, what, what else should they know about you, Tom, anything? Well, I'm an engineer, yeah. and in the education field, we like to build and innovate around education. So I take that discipline of engineering to making advancements in the education okay. field. Good. And then next panelist is Larry Swarsik, who's a professor in the University of Waterloo. Uh, okay. Same question, Larry. So, Anything other in, in, interesting about you other than that? Uh, well, I've, uh, I've got a, a new book out called Water in Southern Africa, and it was published in Southern Africa be, and in paper, so it could be affordable and reach the audience that it needed. And the title is? Water in Southern Africa. Water in Southern Africa. Yeah. Okay. Right. So Water in Southern Africa. 
That's the book you published. Yeah. Water in Southern Africa, and we're all going to go out and buy it. That's right. It's, a four, it's cheap, $20. Uh, it's very $20. Cheap. <laughs> Can I get a free copy off you? Or no. Oh, no. Um, our final panelist is John Twaits, who's a profes professional fellow in Monash, Monash University in Australia. Um, and he's also chair of Climate Works Australia and chair of the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. Okay. So again, same question. Anything interesting other than that? Well, I'm a former politician, so I've gone to a university to try and restore my reputation. That's right. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we, ha we, have that, we have that link to former ambassador, to the former uh, politician. Uh, so that's, and then Shantrik is a, a former UN person. We must remember that as well in the, in the MDGs. Okay, so what I'm going to do is um, please hashtag me as they speak. And, you know, we can be a little bit disruptive. Um, but each have prepared seven minutes, so I'm proposing as each goes up, I try and take in the questions on the hashtag, and when they come back, we'll just give a little question, um, and others can start joining in as the presentations come along, and hopefully it will evolve into just a huge big row by the end of it, and keep <laughs> us all alive before we go to lunch. Okay. Chandrika. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Paul. Uh, it's an honor to be here on this panel. I'm very aware that we stand between you and food, so uh, we'll all try and keep it short. Uh, I think this topic is particularly interesting because it's at the heart of what we do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I represent the SDG Academy, and uh, I will speak about that a little bit later. Uh, but what I wanted to start with was a reference point, which I think is helpful. We all know this, but it's helpful to frame our conversation. And this is the reference point. We are a young world. We are a young world today, but even in 2050, when uh, we know the world population is aging, we'll still be a young world. So the UN Population uh, Division predicts that in 2050, the median age worldwide will be 36 years. So what that means is half the world population is going to be under the age of 30, 36. And in the least developed countries, that figure is actually 26 years. So we're really talking of a predominantly young population. And what it means for sustainable development and for the SDGs is that it is young people who are going to be at the cutting edge of solving the problems that need to be solved to achieve the goals. They're also the ones who are going to bear the brunt of the consequences of inaction. So in the world that we are living in with rising inequality, with changing weather patterns, with extreme weather uh, incidents, it's the young people who are going to have to deal with these uh, major, major challenges. And it is for us, the academic and the practitioner community that works on sustainable development, to be able to train them and to equip them with what they need to know to be able to deal with that world. And if we fail, then they will bear the brunt of our inaction. So really, the, what's, stake, uh, what's at stake here is the achievement of the SDGs for this large cohort of population that we're going to be seeing moving from what is now early childhood, preteen years, well into their 20s and 30s. So it's really important that we get this right. And I think the exercise that Paul is leading with the revision of the curriculum on sustainable development is exactly what's needed uh, to focus on that. What is it that we have learned uh, in, in, the, in the different things that we do? And I want to talk about a few things that matter for sustainable development and why it's different now from what it was um, maybe 10 years ago when the commission first sat. I would say the first difference is what's considered sustainable development. And about a decade, decade and a half ago, this was essentially limited to economics and climate science and a little bit of environmental science. What Agenda 2030 and the SDGs have done is that they have expanded that mandate much beyond. So now we're looking at a range of issues. We're looking at urbanization. We're looking at agriculture. We're looking at public health, education. These are not easy topics to teach and learn from. And neither do universities and programs of sustainable development necessarily have the expertise to bring all of these together. So this is the first challenge, that how do you cover this breadth of issues? The second challenge is that these goals are complex and they're interrelated. So how do you equip uh, students of these subjects with the tools to understand how to make sense of the relationships, the complexities and the trade-offs and the synergies. They're doable. It is, there are tools that exist, but these are not always taught systematically. So that's the second aspect that I think becomes important. 
The third is that sustainable development is one of those uh, wonderful subjects that, are, that is global in nature. So there are challenges that affect the entire planet. And yet, many times, the solutions are national, they're regional, they're very, very local. So being able to connect what is a very broad, in, international, global set of challenges and then bringing them down to what, what the, how that translates into your neighborhood or your community is also a skill that needs to be taught. And vice versa, how do you take local solutions, local problems, and then link them up to what's happening across the world? This is an aspect of learning which is largely missing in most programs around the world, but it's something that will become essential. The next element is that sustainable development is not an abstract subject. It has immediate practical relevance. And so anything that is taught has to be grounded in practice. And again, this is something that the MDP pioneered 10 years ago, which was to build in this practical training element as part of the teaching. And what we've learned from those 10 years, Paul, and I, I, I'm sure you'd agree, is that the practica is often the most valuable part of the learning process for students. So we want to make sure we find a way of doing that and, and constantly exposing students to what's actually happening on the ground. Linked to that is the fact that sustainable devol development is not a static subject. It is continually evolving. And I think more than many other fields, this is one where we're learning new things every day about what works, what doesn't work, what's effective, what uh, translates well into different circumstances and what doesn't. So again, pr programs that teach this in whatever shape and form have to continually have the ability to take what's coming out from the real world and immediately make that happen. And finally, we need to be able to work in very diverse institutional settings. Governments are very different from nonprofits, are very different from local government. And so students need to understand what is institutional specificity. What I run is the SDG Academy. We, I won't spend a lot of time on it except to tell you that we have, over the last three years, had about 150,000 enrollments into courses that we design that are inspired by the sustainable goals. We use technology, so we are operating at scale. And what we found is that there is an enormous interest in creating a global cohort of students, an enormous uh, thirst for learning. So what you're seeing here is our most latest offering that launches on September 20th, and I'd encourage everyone to visit the website and enroll. Uh, but enough of that. I want to quickly end with five points that I think we need to focus on. One, learning has to be in a loop of research, teaching, and practice. That's absolutely essential and it has to be continuous and from multiple sources. If there's anything the information age has done for us is it's broken the monopoly of knowledge. So it's not any one professor, but students are learning from all over. Technology is going to impact how learning happens. Now, it, the exact shape and form may change, but it will impact learning. We are going to look at learning beyond the formal years of university. So uh, professionals who are a large part of our cohort at the academy are going to continually want new material and refresher skills. This is something that Tom specializes in, uh, but it's, and he, you know, he's pioneered this, but this is going to be uh, an increasing demand around the world. And finally, we're going to need very clear protocols for how we deal with different subjects across the SDGs. That's not something that exists right now, but it's something that will need to come together as a unified um, set of topics or a unified pedagogy for teaching. Um, and finally, as I'd mentioned earlier, institutional specific skill sets uh, is something that students will demand and will need. So Paul, you had asked us to look at 2050 and predict what's going to happen. I can't do that. But what we can do is look at what we have and see the, the trends that emerge, and that's what this looks like. So that's what the SDGs have given us, a framework to really think about how to teach sustainable development comprehensively. Okay. So Thank I have you. a question for you, and if you can, Ram, Rama will set up. You're next, yeah? And uh, while you're setting up, I'm going to ask Sandrika a question. Um, so these MOOCs are really professionally well produced and they're, they're glorious, right? But one thing that surprised me that you didn't hint on and in, in a forward look was the whole idea of setting up these MOOCs was open access. It right. was to get out of just you know, a lot of people, how do we embed this, this into curriculum in our university? But you were, your ambition is more than that, right? You want to basically to have access to knowledge on sustainable development across all the partnerships and reach down as far as you can, right? As far as technology access can bring you, right? So it was Jeff's dream 
of a kind of an open university with free fees, basically, to learn. So just comment on that. So yeah. that's the dream, basically, right? Right. So that's what that's our dream. That's yeah. not necessarily what everybody will do. But I think for us, what was very important was to uh, provide this knowledge free to everyone. Yeah. That was the that was the starting point, and that that's something that we stick to. Uh, but it also links back a little bit to what I'd said earlier about when people want to learn. Mm. And that's changing. So it's not just when people are in university that they want to learn. They want to learn when they're on the job. One of the highest uptakes that we found is for a course we ran on early childhood development, where over 60% of our students were working professionals. And they did the course because it was something that was relevant to them in their day to day. Even in university context, and I want to, uh, I want to emphasize this point because I think it's important. What technology does and what uh, large scale courses do is that they actually shrink the cost of teaching per student. Mm. Because yes, we invest in creating a course, but once we create it, the marginal cost of reaching an additional student is zero. As long as a student has uh, Wi-Fi and a, and a device, they can take the course anytime they want at their leisure um, in any part of the world. So this is going to transform university uh, financial structures. Mm. Again, we don't know how. But hopefully what it'll do is it'll make education of this kind affordable um, to many, many more people. Okay, excellent. So we might be coming back to that. So Ramu, tell us what the UN want from us. Because I see your website, and we should all be registering and saying what our universities uh, do. And uh, so you're going to tell us what you want from us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. And uh, thank you, Chandrika. I think, as you mentioned, looking ahead to 2050 is a daunting task. I should mention, by the way, that uh, Unlike Chandrika, I'm probably the world's sole surviving Indian who is technologically illiterate, so I don't have a PowerPoint. So it's just going to be me. But um, to go back to your idea of projecting to 2050, which is 33 years from now, I think it would be useful to go back 33 years and visualize how it would have been if we were here at Columbia University in 1984, and you had a projector saying ICSD before you. In all likelihood, you'd have been students of chemistry, and ICSD would have stood for the inorganic cluster sequence database. I mention that also because even though you would have been students of chemistry, what you were doing with the ICSD in 1984, three years before the term sustainable development had come into vogue, would have been of enormous importance for the world at large just as sustainable development education is today. Because were it not for the chemistry aspect of ICSD, you would not have x-rays, you would not have penicillin, you would not have a host of health solutions which these have made possible. And to go back to your point, Paul, about the academic impact, the reason we started this, and I suspect that there was more than a quiet hand of Professor Jeffrey Sachs in talking to Secretary General Ban Ki-moon about this, was the realization that any discipline you teach in a university or study in a university can have a beneficial impact on the world at large. And so there's no subject which is too remote or too esoteric, be it philosophy, be it architecture, be it obviously public health, where research cannot directly benefit the United Nations and its goals. And that, of course, leads to the larger question about training young leaders for the sustainable development era that we are embarking upon. And I'm glad in a sense that you use the word training and not education, because training to my mind encompasses education. Training is, as um, Chandrika has put it, lifelong education, lifelong learning, but it also goes beyond the classroom into the training that people command, young people command as potential leaders. And the remarkable feature of the demographics that we saw earlier this, uh, this afternoon is that virtually everyone has the capacity to create a space for leadership which she or he exercises. In other words, you're not looking for leadership in tried and trusted professions. You're not looking to advance along a trajectory that other people have moved in before. You are creating your own avenues which you feel could quite obviously benefit yourself in terms of per uh, personal fulfillment, but also be of importance to the world. And that measure of training is, I think, something that we see across the world now, facilitated in, in large extent by 
communications by the ability that people have to reach out to each other, and also by an increasing conviction that ultimately sustainable development measures self-interest. Only last week at uh, Presidio, which is uh, where, where Tom was, they had started a program called Sustainable Fashion, where they took a statistic, and this is where the remarkable feature comes in. You take something you read, and you translate that into first experience. What is the statistic? Every year, every American discards 80 pounds of clothes. That is a fact. How do you bring that into the realm of your own action and your own activity? You create a ground in San Francisco where people repurpose their clothes, either exchanging them with each other, bartering them, or refashioning them so they become new clothes so those don't end up in a landfill. That is training for sustainable development. You go to Monash University, where Professor Thwaites is from, and the remarkable work being done there using an innocuous fish, the zebra fish, and using its structure to be able to discern parallels which a human being suffering from muscular dystrophy or cancer can use to regenerate her or his organs. That transference, if you will, from something which is again a very, very specific and esoteric science into something which can lead into the public domain is what is important. If you also take it a step further, where the academic impact really tries to make a difference is to persuade people that universities and colleges and institutions, and more than that, the students and teachers who work there, are not living in a separate abstract universe. I ask you to do just one thing if you can over this weekend. Go over the citations to the Nobel Prizes in physics and chemistry and medicine for the last 40 years, and you will find that each one of them recognizes a specific accomplishment, which is good academically, but also an accomplishment that makes a difference to the world at large. And again, to go back to the idea of training, Paul had once mentioned how households are innately sustainable. When you create a family, when you bring up children, when you create your home, you have to be sustainable. You have to live within the income you have. You have to make sure that your children get the education they deserve. So that model of intimate sustainability, if you will, is what is going to be inspirational for leaders beyond that. I remember many years ago, I met a wonderful woman who was familiar with, with Botswana, then Bekwana land, Naomi Mitchison. And she told me the one thing that children in Botswana learn is before you ask a question, you always say, how are you? And you wait for the answer because you're interested in how the other person is. That degree of civility, of courtesy, of looking at other people, not as a resource, not as an indicator, but someone in whose future you are interested, is to my mind key to the training and also to my mind the assurance that that training will be fulfilled. We meet this afternoon in an auditorium named after Rune Aldrich. Many of you are familiar with his name. He was an ABC executive who brought sports into prime time, Monday Night Football, the World Series, he realized that you could not have these matches at two in the afternoon and have them unwatched. He moved them to the evenings when people would watch. I personally am convinced, I know Secretary General Antonio Guterres of the United Nations is convinced, Jeff Sachs is convinced, that today, the generation that we are training will bring sustainable development into prime time. And conferences like this, chances to get together, will only further that mission. Thank you. Thank you. So can I ask uh, Tom to, to set up? OK. So I have one question for you, right? So when you go on to the, the website for the UN Academic Impact, which everybody will, and they want to register university, they ask you tough questions, right? Like your, your statutes of your university, show us where the research and education outreach pertains or is somehow linked or mapped into the SDGs, right? What I kind of find is that this is a big battleground because universities have maybe lost their way a bit in the sense that their core values and what work they're doing, like say sonic booming on the Atlantic Ocean looking for gas 
or intensive agriculture, you know, that there are things happening in the university term that are really quite against the SDG project, right? So do you see that tension on the website? And how do you get around that? How do you encourage, like, to empower those universities to fight that battle, you know, in terms of where the research is coming, the money's coming, the focus? Because you want to refocus them, right? Our experience has been that in virtually every university there is a school, a faculty, or sometimes an individual who is prepared to make that difference and work with the United Nations. Yeah. And that's at the moment all that we ask for. Okay. Because we, we try and enroll universities as a large entity because we don't want to have a multiplicity of memberships. Sure. But if a university possesses that, as quite clearly Columbia does, yeah. that makes a difference. Right. So you want the overall thing, but you just, you're quite happy even just to see the elements of this Absolutely. across the university. Absolutely. Because that's the yeah. beginning of the battle right. and we empower that. And that's, and that's the thing Dan said. Great. Okay. Tom. Thank you, Paul. So, of course, I'm with Harvard University, and many of you know the ivory towers and the 381-year institution. Well, I come from the Division of Continuing Education, and, and to give you context of my world, later on today I'll give a lecture. Tomorrow and the day after I'll give a lecture to students around the world. My world is distance education. There are 350 graduate students in my program. More than 2,500 students are pursuing uh, courses within my curriculum. My world is a world that stretches across the world. And so when Paul invited me here as a modality, my modality is distance education. That is my reality. When I step into a classroom, I'm talking to people in front of me. I'm talking to the cameras who are streamed live. I'm talking to those who will watch me two or three days later. And the big thing that happens right now is engagement. I have to engage with my students through time and space. And that is the big shift that's happening. The breakdown in time and space. Number one idea. Number two idea, this is a yes and thing. In other words, there are many things that we do as educators that are great and that we teach around critical thinking, we teach around mathematics, we teach around reading, we teach around communications, we teach around organizational change, and then we have to move on and above that. And that is, again, engagement. So engagement means, in my class uh, last week when we were talking about the Houston situation in Hurricane Harvey, which many of you know about, some of the students said, these companies need to be more resilient. There's toxic chemicals going around in the environment. Well, I have students in my class who also work for specialty companies that are in Houston, and they spoke up, and they shared their advice, they shared their professionalism. And so in this space of education, where we're speeding towards faster and faster communication, we need to harness that, we need to leverage that. So with that, you know, we heard the word training, Dr. Murbati earlier said the word mentorship. And I, I did write it down here before she spoke about that, but I totally agree with this. Mentorship is another piece of the puzzle. And mentorship means not just guiding what you know. There's a shared interest of success. We as educators share in your success, those, the, the future students. And we want to bring you along and along in that path of success. So it's not just training. Again, a yes and. Yes, we train you on skills, but also mentorship, involvement with alumni, involvement with the global association. These are critical things in order to be successful. But also, in that global reach, and we heard a little bit about that earlier, the importance of local connections, local knowledge, bringing the voice of local knowledge will be another factor of success. As a master's in development practice has field study work, we're working on curriculum that allows for, in a distance environment, field study in place. And I think this is incredibly important because local knowledge needs to be shared. Local knowledge is not only empowerment, it's effectiveness in implementation. And as a couple of final thoughts here, we're moving in this great acceleration from a world of agrarian societies to industrialization to service industries, many in here in Western Europe and the United States. 
And what is the next step? What is the next thing we are looking at? And that next step is something called the noosphere. It's a fancy word for saying human thought, global thoughts, are coming together. And they're coming with speed. And with that speed, there's empowerment to make change. Unfortunately, change for the worse, but as well as change for the good. And we have to recognize that. As socioeconomic societies move, move forward, we're seeing larger and larger effects of self-expression. How many do selfies, post on Facebook, et cetera? These are pieces that we're bringing into the classroom right now. Self-expression is becoming the norm. And as I bring that into my classroom, as students express, as I gave the example earlier, specialties in different industries that bring and share to other students, this will help us to buffer against the speed of what is happening, recognizing that self-expression is a, is a key aspect of moving forward and reacting to these things. And so as a final aspect, we also need to make sure that our students have that meta-analysis view. In other words, as I mentioned earlier, I'm an engineer, when we're engineering education, we need to understand where we need to improve. Take what we have, yes and, and move forward. Thank you. So, Larry, if you, you want to... So, what I kind of found interesting when I first met you, right, is on one hand, you know, I see you, uh, I, like I, I'm used to teaching day masters or day students and they're in, in, in the room beside me, okay? Mm -hmm. And a little bit of experience of global classroom, but not your experience, right? So I'm saying, like, how do we really talk about knowledge and innovate if we're not face-to-face, -face, not together, et cetera, right? But then when you came to the MPP, the, the merits of what we were doing on the field place, we say, well, there's an opportunity for Pete to get and get real experience and do things together in the local innovate knowledge that you talked about, right? But in your vision of going forward, and particularly I'm thinking of the online MOOCs that are in SDG Academy, right? When you look at us guys doing the day masters, just you know, doing the normal um, module teaching with the 25 in the room, like, is there something in the background you'd just like to tell us? Like to say, guys, what we are missing here, if you were working with me in Harvard, and the way we deliver our modules, and the way, like, you are missing something big here. Um, is there something that we're missing? Yeah. Um, certain things scale and certain things don't. People learn at human speed. People form relationships with each other. So we can scale the technology, but there's the connections, the human connections we make. Again, the yes and. Those human connections are still very important. And they will take time to forge, again, human relationship speed. So it's that mashup. We can reach a broad audience, but recognize the speed for people to, yeah. to uh, assimilate it. And I think you have tricks to get that, even though it's online, you get that human connection going. Yeah. You give them little spaces to talk, to do work together, communicate together, so you in some, somehow, up in that cloud, you get that human interaction yeah. going, right? Which we haven't really thought about enough, or we haven't uh, blended enough. Okay, Larry. All right, thanks, uh, thanks very much. There's all that stands between you and lunch is the two of us, <laughs> and, and a conversation, and a conversation. All right, I, I uh, uh, am the director of a master's development practice program in, in Canada. Uh, I uh, came to the University of Waterloo from uh, the University of Botswana, where I was for 11 years. And the attraction of the MDP for, for me, in particular, was the same as it was uh, I took a job at Waterloo to, to build an undergraduate program in international development that was uh, highly practical. And what I saw in, uh, in my years in, in Africa was, uh, you know, just a nonstop uh, 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 sort of wave of uh, interested people from around, youth from around the world who wanted to help. They had passion and interest and, you know, they had no capabilities, right? You know, they, so you would skill them up and then they'd leave. And then you would say, oh, you know, that, that was f great for them, and I made some lifelong friends, but uh, at the same time, it was a real time suck out of the people on the ground at the receiving end. And every year when the students would come, we would groan a bit and say, oh, here we go again. 
And so what I liked about the MDP and, and, uh, and my undergrad program at Waterloo was that we, we were building skills. So it's very much not just theory, but very much practice oriented. And I think, you know, that's it. So it's not just teaching, it's training um, and so on and so forth. Um, none of my students in uh, my master's of development practice is an old white man, right? Uh, Maybe that's not a good thing. Maybe the old white man should come in. I know one in particular who could use some re-schooling re uh, as I visit the United States. Um, and, and I like to think of, uh, of my own position as a facilitator, you know? Increasingly as a facilitator of education, not a determiner of education. To try to harness that energy that's been talked about here and to, and to you know, steer rather than, than, uh, than row. Um, our MDP program, our association, you know, we talk about a master's of, uh, like, sort of like an MBA for sustainable development where we build better managers. And the focus has been a around broadening, uh, thinking critically across uh, places, issues, categories, uh, a systemic, holistic, uh, transdisciplinary perspective where we talk about bridging, trying to be, you know, to develop uh, someone who can be, you know, that we can bridge differences um, and, and different perspectives and also skill up for complexity or development 2.0 and things like that. Um, at the same time, many of our programs deepen, so there's a niche aspect to the different uh, programs. And, uh, and, and we aim for a kind of a complementary effort about, across uh, MDP associations. Um, now, so there's a broadening and a deepening, but I think we largely work within accepted par paradigms. And if this is innovative, it's largely through the integrative side of things. And this has to change. And I, 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 the last couple of minutes of my remarks, I want to talk about perhaps where we have to go. And if, it's, and if it's even possible, I don't know how, you know, I don't have any answers, I'm sorry to say. I have, no, I have a lot of questions, but I don't have any answers. We, how do you plan, how do you teach, how do you educate for surprise, right? Not continuity, but change. Not the Holocene, but the Anthropocene. How do you do that? Um, Agenda 2030, the world we want, if we're going to achieve that, that's 13 years away, and our current grads will be in the... 35 to 40 year old mid-career range, so they will be somehow implementing whatever comes out of this. But uh, in 2030, the MDP student of uh, 2030 will just be born uh, today, right? They're just being born, right? The MDP students of 2030 are just being born. That's our audience, right? And our audience are today's MDP who must lead and plan for those just now being born. And somehow our programs have to pave the way. So I want to end on, on three major challenges. I think one thing that those of us still here, aging as we are, um, we, you know, we can facilitate. We can op you know, facilitate openings, bridgings, collaborative activity, you know, openings, not closings, connections, not, uh, not disconnections. Um, we somehow have to get beyond management. Right, the, the SDGs and the nice boxes all looks very managerial, and somehow that suggests uh, following in line. And I think we have to move away from that uh, towards, you know, we have to, I mean, it doesn't, it sounds, how do you teach disruption, right? I mean, you need discipline. How do you teach people to be indisciplined across disciplines? We have, somehow we have to do this. We have to make the space for students to have disruptive ideas, to be indisciplined and tell us that things have to change. That's, that's challenge number one. Challenge number two is that somehow we have to create a context that empowers the, the, these young people because usually if you're young, you're just, you know, many of you here are here, youth of today are here because you want to network and get a job. You don't feel empowered. Um, in a classroom setting, uh, you know, oftentimes it's, it's the, the message is to behave, not to misbehave. Um, how do you feel empowered to stand up against uh, certain things when you've got that? And I don't know, I don't know how we do this. I welcome ideas. My last, uh, uh, 
challenge is um, how to reach out to the rest of the 22-year-olds. Uh, we started off with the, with the youth bulge. And um, you know, most of the, most of the 22-year-olds of today aren't in this room. They are unreachable, right? They are the bottom billion and all of you know, these sorts of uh, languages that we use to, to discipline them by, by their absence, right? And, and I think a, a big challenge for us is to, to try to figure out how to uh, you know, have this truly a, a collective enterprise where the education that gets delivered touches everybody who, uh, so that they can all be part of the, uh, part of the conversation, part of the solution, uh, as opposed to a continuing part of the problem. So, so like I said, you know, we have to get beyond elites towards some radical, radical pedagogical change. Um, I don't have the answers to this. I have the questions. I would love for uh, you there to, to give us some ideas, give me some ideas, so we can facilitate this as we move toward Agenda 2030. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank so John, Matt, you, you can Okay, so I have some good questions. So uh, there's the US Youth Observer, and she's pointing out that youth are not the future, they are today. And what, what basically they're saying, and I, and I think I'm hearing this from Larry a little bit, is that the aim of the MDP really is to try and train these young professionals to get, get them into senior positions quite rapidly. I mean, this is the whole idea, right? That you, know, you get them into business or into running NGOs, into senior positions in government, into senior positions in, in the private sector at a young age. That is our goal, right? So the youth are today, and this agenda needs to be done immediately, and people who are trained appropriately should get in there, right? The next question, I think, is very interesting. It says, uh, Really, I think if I did an MBA, I'd get a better job. This MDP, what's the market demand out there? Who the hell wants to hire people with these skills? Isn't that the problem? My answer to that, and it's a little bit about reorientating universities, right? You do create your own demand, right? Because, you know, when you put MDPs into corporates, when you put them into civil society organizations or into governments, they want to hire their values and what they look like, right? So by actually being successful in putting these same development kind of professionals into these type of partnerships, they will go out and they'll want to hire and do business and they will create their own demand in terms of expanding the demand for this type of trained uh, person, right? So it's infectious, basically, right? Good values are, are basically infectious as you put them through the partnership. So that's my answer. Don't do the MBA, do the MDP. Get a job that an MBA would have got and then when you're in there, do business, but make it more socially inclusive and sustainable for the planet, and then you'll go to heaven and you'll be rich, and it's all sorted. Okay, John. Thanks, Patrick. Well, uh, this morning, uh, Jeff Sachs started by saying we should be all about implementation now of the Sustainable Development Goals. And certainly, universities have got a key role to play in that implementation. Without university research, we won't get the solutions that we need. Without university education, we won't have the SDG implementers. But as Chandrik has said, this is a somewhat complex agenda, and it's not always easy for universities, whether it's administration or students, to work out how to implement the SDGs in the university. And Last year, we certainly faced this problem in Australia. A number of universities were keen to take action, but didn't know exactly what to do. And so through the SDSN Australia Pacific, we decided to prepare a guide for universities to implement the goals. And we've just launched uh, last week, and hopefully we'll do a, a further launch here in New York, this guide getting started with the SDGs in universities. And you can download it, uh, if you just uh, Google SDSN Australia Pacific, you'll be able to download it. And what we do in that guide, we first talk about the key roles that universities can play in education, in research. But not just education and research, it's all about how, as a large institution, we can make sure that our operations are consistent with the goals. 
And finally, we focus on how universities can play a key role in community leadership. Universities are good at bringing different sectors together, whether it's business, government, civil society, around these difficult challenges and coming up with solutions. What we also do in the guide is put forward a step-by-step -step plan for universities who wish to implement the, go the goals. And the first thing you need to do is actually map what is your university doing. And that's a lot easier said than done. Uh, we were amazed when we started off at, at Monash University, where I am, to try to find out where the researchers were that had some linkage to the goals. And what we did was we actually sought to track them down by locating about 350 key words associated with the goals. And then we searched through all their publications and their research grants. And we found that we had around 500 researchers at our university alone that were involved in the goals. And at University of Technology Sydney, they did the same thing. I think Katie Ross from uh, UTS is here, and she was part of the guide. But in all the universities that we're talking to, we're hearing the same thing. It's quite a difficult challenge to map exactly what you're doing. Second thing that you need to do is to build capacity and ownership of the goals. But it has to also be at the top. In too many universities, it's the sustainability manager or the sustainability professor. You've got to have the president of the university and the senior management behind it. And for that reason, we actually devised a commitment for university presidents to sign to the goals. And now we've had many Australian universities and some New Zealand universities sign that commitment. But what's important is that it's the president of the university, the vice chancellor, signing it. Then you need to identify your priorities and gaps. You know, where does the university want to put its effort in the goals? And finally, what you need to do is embed the goals, not just at the side of what you do in the university, but right in the centre of what you do through your university strategy. Now, finally, what I want to do is just talk about a few challenges, some of the difficulties. The first is in education. It's actually difficult to mainstream sustainable development across all courses. It's easy to have a course, but how do you mainstream it across accounting, law, science? And the biggest challenge for that is not the students, it's the faculty. In most universities, getting the faculty to have the desire and the capacity to change their teaching courses in this direction is a huge challenge. Second point is research. I think we all know that university research is traditionally in silos, that the major uh, KPI for a university researcher is the journal, the academic journal, and it's not necessarily working with other researchers in different disciplines to solve a sustainable development problem. How do we provide the incentives for researchers to be involved in interdisciplinary research is a key challenge. And then finally, leadership in the community. It is true that universities have a key role there. We do have a lot of respect and credibility. But at the same time, I think we have to face up to the fact that we're not necessarily always that good at politics or policy. And so one thing that universities need to do, I think, is put more effort into understanding the political process and how to translate their research into policy action that makes a difference. Thank you. So I want you all to think of questions for each other. We, we don't have that much time. But I'm just going to give you an interesting story. I've been banging on about the, about the SDGs in my own university. And everybody thinks it's nice. It's a, list, a ray of hope. It's nice over a cup of coffee. But it's, it's, not, it's hard to see whether it's really changing what's going on in the university. Then came the announcement that framework nine of the European Commission will, as a backdrop, have SDGs as their backdrop. Suddenly, the university management team are on my doorstep. They say, OK, if the European Commission is replacing Horizons 2020 with an SDG backdrop, and all the national funding authorities are going to follow, and the European Research Council, 
Like, this is 36 billion dollars, or uh, six, 36 billion euros. So now we're interested, okay? So it's one thing, say, the question I'm putting to you, it's one thing to say communicate within to your other colleagues, communicate to politicians, right? But I think where you change things is you go to the European and national funding authorities and your own quangos that manage funding and you make sure the money is following the SDGs. Everything else will fall into place. You don't, don't have to worry. Would you agree with that? Well, I agree absolutely, Patrick. And, and with academics, you don't actually need a lot of money, no. but you need to get something there that will attract them yeah. in the first place. Uh, one thing that we've uh, found quite successful is providing some funding for interdisciplinary research right. to get it started. Yeah. Just to uh, get groups of academics that don't normally work together to at least provide enough to get a project off the ground. So if other parts of the world would follow what Europe was doing, I think we'd get a lot further ahead. It'd be a game changer. Right? It would be a game changer. Questions for each other? And uh, I'm still w I'm watching here the, the Twitter feed, so. Well, I'll ask Larry, how do you, how do you get your students to be in discipline? How do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to say uh, this, this goes for everybody else's students. Not, not yours. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, well, you have to create, uh, you have to, I would argue that there need to be, you know, spaces for creative, you know, let, you know, you, you say, okay, we're going to do this, but you guide, you know, you, you know, you, it's like hanging on by the coattails rather than the kind of a system where I'm the expert and it's very delicate, delicate. So for example, we, I, every year I bring a dozen or 15 students here who've written papers out of my course on water at the University of Waterloo. And, and so I say that we're going to explore this topic this year, and you know this is you lead, and I will right. So they're doing the rowing, but I'm sort of trying to keep the rudder going. Um, and sometimes what comes up is 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 quite unique. You know, you might get because students are also reticent to be experiment experimentative, right? They right they want the A. Unfortunately, what's the rubric? What's the you know? And, and so most of what you get will be orthodox, but every once in a while something pops up that is completely unorthodox, and that's what you want, right? That's what you, you, you're trying to facilitate. Yeah, the, the water sessions from the MDP Waterloo students are always rocking. We'll see <laughs> that tomorrow. Yeah. Yes, I have a question both for Tom and Larry and John. Uh, when we talk about linking research and teaching and practice, mm. there really isn't a good model in the sustainable development field. And you, know, Tom, you and I have spoken about this in the concept of a teaching hospital. And what uh, the medical profession did was to put research and teaching and practice in the same space. So as you were becoming a training to be a doctor, you also started practicing under supervision. And that taught you how to be a doctor. Now, can you think or do you think universities can actually create spaces be they centers of research or centers of practice, which actually not only interact with the local community, but allow for students to do this sort of seamless, uh, under supervision, uh, learning by doing, the way the medical profession was able to do it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, um, and, and also the institution itself is changing. Um, you know, my institution has uh, instructors that are from not only um, local colleges and universities, but also, if you will, professors of the practice. Um, and their specialty comes into the curriculum very quickly and adaptive, whether it be a topic around circular economy, a topic about net zero building construction. These are all topics that I bring into the program very quickly as in response to what the students need. Now, the challenge, Chandrika, as you say, is what, what is that working environment? In our distance model, we would have to partner with other organizations that are geographically located. And I think that that's the greatest challenge, is making sure that those uh, relationships can withstand the, uh, the test of time for students. Uh, as a university, we are obligated to ensure that they can get through the program and get their degree. So these relationships need to be very uh, solidified and substantial. Can I, I'd like to just, uh, not necessarily in particular talk about the University of Waterloo 
uh, I think in principle, all the MDPs try to have a mix of, of this, right? But I, I want to talk about a, uh, something I was involved with uh, while I was in, in Botswana, is something called Waternet. Waternet, uh, and, and it speaks to the critique about aid. There's different kinds of aid, right? Um, where, uh, and partnerships and, 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 and creativity and so on. Uh, 20 years ago, the, the, the Dutch were the presidents of the EU, um, and, uh, and, and with the SADC, the Southern African Development Community, they partner, the incoming presidency partners on a special project. And 20 years ago, they decided to, to, to create WaterNet, this water network of uh, teaching, training, and research, um, and so on. And it, and it put six universities together, each one with a niche. Uh, two of the universities, one in Zimbabwe, one in Tanzania, were the degree-granting institution, but the others chipped in with a specialization, health, environment, and so on. Um, and, and so, you know, so you, this has been going 20 years now. So you've got the, uh, every year, 20 funded masters of uh, science in integrated water resources management would come to, would be funded by the Dutch to study at these places. And so on. There's a research arm funded by the Swedes. Um, that now the private sector has come in. Uh, international organizations have come in. The re it's expanded to Eastern Africa. So there's a kind of a, you know, it's a, there's a, a, a great idea had some uh, money and I, money come in and it's exploded. And I think we could replicate that in in any field in any way in many ways. I want to give Brandon the the last word, and I have two announcements then. No, I think to go back to the point that um, Chandrika mentioned, it's really a time, if you will, between university courses, what students are prepared to do outside the university, which may be completely unrelated to their course, but inspired by its larger mission of sustainable development. And then, frankly, the third element, which is entrepreneurship, which brings in the private sector and also, in a sense, to put it very boldly, commercializes the uh, Masters of uh, Development program. So I don't at all see a reason for pessimism there. I think that with universities being more receptive to the world in which they operate, with students being more receptive to how they interact with each other and having that degree of peer empathy, we are in fairly safe hands. Okay, excellent. Hmm. Um, so we didn't quite get there to what this is going to look like. Hopefully people here are going to shape that destiny and we'll blend a lot of what we're learning here. But we are going to continue this conversation on Thursday, and everybody's Wednesday, welcome Wednesday, to come. Wednesday. Wednesday. On Wednesday, that's right. <laughs> um, I did that on purpose, just to emphasize it's Wednesday. Um, and you're all very welcome to come along. And uh, certainly, we want the views of, uh, of not just staff and universities, but any other entity uh, as well. Just to, in terms of Lucia Rodriguez wants to make one announcement, just in terms of empowering um, young people. So, the, the business uh, women are leaders that you're going to see in the panel in the afternoon. Uh, they're having a session of high-powered women in sustainable development in the low library between five and seven. And they've asked that uh, MDP students and others, if you want to pretend to be MDP students, but women only, if put on their best business suits and their CV and business cards and to go over to the low library at 5 p.m. for two hours uh, in the family, what's called uh, the family room, or the faculty room, the faculty room, uh, and basically they want to jumpstart you into a high-powered position in sustainable development, okay? So women only, business suit, business card, at 5 p.m., low library in the faculty room. Um, what time is it? I don't know. What, I think it's 10. 10, 10 yeah. So 10 o'clock, and it's... In, it's in this building, apparently. Yeah. Uh, so in, in, in the learner hall. So uh, at 10 o'clock on Wednesday, we'll re reignite this conversation about uh, what, we, what we need for the future of and development. So anyway, we're running to lunch. Round of applause for the speakers. Thank you. Thanks,